Good evening, everybody. If we can make our way to our seats and stand in the presence of the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to serve the living God, a God that is faithful, a God that answers prayer. And I'm thankful to be here tonight, and I'm thankful for He. The Lord's faithful is something small, Brother David, but I thank the Lord every morning. I thank Him for hot water. I thank Him, I thank him for a house that's warm. It's small things, but I don't think it's things we should overlook. The Lord's doing great things. It is a great time to serve the Lord. I'm thankful for everything going on. We had a... Just thinking on things throughout the day, what the Lord's been doing. We had another great men's prayer breakfast this past Sunday. I'm thankful for the men who cooked for us. And Brother Christian, the Bible says, let your prayer be set forth before thee as incense. And when we walked in the prayer room, I just didn't know incense smelled like eggs, sausage, and biscuits. And But, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that amen. And uh, Brother, Brother Garrison showed me some videos of several men getting together and going to the gym. And I think it's a great thing to be connected to the body. And it's a great, great thing for men to go out in the community together because everywhere is the field. Every, we need to take this gospel everywhere. And myself, I've had many conversations in the gym. I've had conversations with Pastor of another denomination about the oneness of God, about Jesus' name, baptism. We can take this gospel everywhere. Amen. I'm thankful for the ladies' night. Katie let me know we had 53 ladies there on Monday night. And that is, that is wonderful. It is a good thing. And I'm thankful for the small groups, the Bible studies. It's a good time to teach a Bible study, Brother Christian. The world is hungry for what we got. I assure you, in your job, in your school, wherever you go, people want to know about the name of Jesus. I assure you. Amen. But we're going to go into prayer tonight. Do I got anybody here on my right side with a request, Brother Josh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pastor. Cody and Callie and Sister Stephanie and Brother Donnie are all sick tonight. A lot of special requests. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Remember, uh, remember uh, the Golden family. Buddy Golden died this afternoon. Okay. Brian and Donald and their family. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Crystal. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We will remember. Sister Rita. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Brother Cody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brother Seth. We will remember him. The Lord can do anything. Amen. Anybody else on my right side? Have I missed anybody? Okay. Middle section. Sister Eloise. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Brother Johnny. Yes, sir. Sister Ashley. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. Amen. Sister Judy. Yes, ma'am. Sister Margaret. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody here in this? Did I miss anybody in the middle section here? No. no. My left side, Brother David. Yes, sir.
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will do that. We will do that. Sister Nadine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. We will remember. The Lord will be with them. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He will. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Sister Ann. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else here on my left side? I know there's some testimonies in the room that those things are not too big for the Lord either. Amen. Amen. Anybody else over here? No. Platform? Brother Richard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Mary. One more? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, sickness has been brought up a lot, and we're going to focus on that. And uh, another thing that I was thinking about is we've got some cold weather coming up. And just praying that this sick, the cold does not assist in this sickness going around. But, but in the name of Jesus, that, that's going to come down. And remembering those that don't have heat, that don't have a lot of thick jackets that will be working in it. And being with the workers because um, things could get dangerous. But Lord willing, they don't. And I believe they won't. But uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Anything's possible. So let's go to him in faith tonight that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for every man and woman in here tonight. And Lord, I pray that you prepare our hearts, Lord. Stir up the fallow ground of our heart, Lord, that not a single soul in this place will leave here the same. Lord, I pray that your word would go forth and it would fall on good ground and it would cause a response. Lord, you know everybody, every name that is dealing with sickness. Lord, and I pray for your virtue to flow throughout this house right now, Lord, throughout families, throughout those names that were brought up and throughout those who are connected to the River Bend Pentecostals. I speak healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray over every doctor in the River Bend area. Lord, I pray that you are imparting knowledge and wisdom into every situation, into every surgery, into every procedure, every medicine prescribed, Lord. And I pray for strongholds to come down tonight. I pray for the high places to come down tonight. I pray for a transformation of New Madra, Missouri, and for a revelation of the name of Jesus to come. Lord, I pray for a revival to come. And I pray that we get a hunger for prayer and we get a hunger for souls, Lord. I pray that your hand is upon our homes. Lord, restore our relationships, Lord. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, you keep your hand on our prodigals. We pray these things with faith and the power and the authority that's in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Worship him for who he is. And my God, our God is a promise keeper. He keeps his promises. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He keeps his promises. He's a provider. I think about David. Many have surrounded him saying there's no help for him in God. But you can't stop his promises. The Lord was going to come through and David was assured of it. He keeps his promises. Hallelujah. We can get our ways to give on the board. You can make your way back to your seat if you would like. We have Givelify, PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madra, Missouri, 63869. Gold pans are for tithing. Wood is for offering. And you can text to give at 833-883-9311. I've heard of many blessings coming since we've been praying this prayer. The Lord is doing great, great things. So let's say this with faith tonight. If you'd like to stand. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise changes everything. It changes everything. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. I can't tell you how many times I've been by myself and I begin to praise the Lord. And He shows up and it changes everything. And pretty soon my mind is saying, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely. I'm thinking on those things, Brother Ronnie. His presence changes everything. You can be seated if you would like. And Children's Church could come forward. Riverbend Kids can come forward. We're going to pray for them tonight. We're going to pray a covering over their minds, over their home, every step that they take. And we're going to pray over the children's room that there would be a focus and that they would understand the word of God from an early age. Amen. So if you don't mind to stretch forth your hand out of faith and let's pray over them tonight right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I plead the blood over these children, Lord, and over their mind. I pray that there is no iniquity that would have dominion over them. Lord, I pray that your light is protecting every step that they take, whether it's in their home, in their school, Lord. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, in that room, in the children's room, there would be miracles, signs, and wonders take place. Lord, I pray that there would be a freedom to pray together. I pray that the things of God would be normal to them, Lord, and they would seek you with their whole heart, and they would be sensitive to your voice and to what you have for them and their home and their life, Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can take them on back, brother. Riverbend ignited. We're going to pray over them as well. And that the Lord would lead them and guide them every single day. And that they could walk with the Lord. So let's do the same thing out of faith. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that your favor and your anointing is upon this, upon this youth group right now, Lord. Every time they witness, every time they pray, Lord, I pray that they know that you are not far from them and they get connected with you. They develop a relationship with you, Lord. I pray that their trust and their faith in you increase, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray, I pray against depression. I pray against anxiety. I pray against suicidal thoughts. I pray against generational curses getting passed down, Lord. But I pray that you use them, Lord. I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that your anointing is upon them and your favor is upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, brother, and lead them back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to turn this over to Pastor GL. I know he's going to have something anointed, and I know he's going to have something that can change our life. Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor. Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Blake, are you happy to be here tonight? Amen. I am happy to be here tonight, and uh, we are grateful. Um, brother Gary Tanner passed away early Sunday morning. We had his funeral yesterday, and uh, we're grateful for the church and the ladies that helped to provide a meal for the family. It was very good because when they provide one for the family, they provide one for G-Money too, whether they want to or not. But no, they don't mind. Matter of fact, they try to give me more food. I need to talk to you. I was at a city council meeting today, and uh, they serve pizza. They made fun of me for eating too much. I'd like for some of y'all to take care of that for me when you get a chance. They, uh, they made fun of me a little bit. But I want to tell you a couple things in all seriousness. Um, I, uh, I want to apologize up front while they're handing out the handout. It's a brand new one for tonight. Some, just a little bit of review and then some brand new material that I feel like the Lord has downloaded before we, uh, before we get into practical holiness. But generally every year we, when I say we, my wife and I have been buying 
first it was apples and oranges and, and uh, candy canes, and then the last couple of three years we bought uh, ornaments. And, uh, and this year, uh, with the intention of changing things up a little bit, we're not going to be doing that, primarily because the number keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, that's a great problem to have. Um, and, and I generally buy a gift for everybody that's involved in ministry that help do things here at the church. And it's usually about 50 people or so that we buy things for, which I'm not the greatest shopper in the world. So that's a job in itself. But now that number, I, I'll be quite honest with you. I started trying to write down everybody that is involved in ministry. Guess what? I don't know who all is involved in ministry no more. It's true. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? So just bear with us this year. I have been talking to, uh, well, since we... Uh, since we stole one of Brother Dainsworth's favorite people, uh, I've been trying to make it up to him by sucking up to him. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm just teasing. But I, I've been talking to Brother Dainsworth and others about how, how you do it when you begin to grow. Because you can't, you can't do everything the same way you always did when it was just a little bitty group of folks. And uh, so he's trying to... He's trying to counsel me, but don't you tell him, don't tell him I said that either. But aren't we happy to have Katie with us? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now I'm going to ask you a question so we get this cleared up. Did I put you up to saying that? No, okay, just so everybody knows. Okay. <laughs> oh, saints. I can't thank the Lord enough for bringing Josh to our church. Well, I'm telling you right now, if he straightens Meredith up, I'm resigning and he's getting the position. <laughs> Ain't that right, Brother Shannon? I quit picking on her that she thinks I'm upset. <laughs> the focus of this teaching is to instill holy principles and behaviors in us. God's people do not act worldly. Okay? God's people don't act worldly. And we need to know how to act. So the focus of this teaching is to instill holy principles and behaviors in us. Principles and behaviors given to us and exampled for us by Jesus Christ. Because we belong to him. He paid for us. All right? He bought us, redeemed us with his blood, the Bible says. We don't belong to the devil and we don't belong to the world. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses, we'll do verses 11 and 12. This is a little bit of review before I blaze into some new stuff. And when I say some new stuff, it's brand new on holiness that the Lord just began to download in me a month or so ago. So, the New King James Version, 2 Corinthians 6, 11 and 12 says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. So the question we have to ask is, what exactly are my affections? Not, for instance, I love my children, and I love my grandbaby, and I love this church, and I love all of y'all, but what are they actually? And they are what I truly love or long for, they are the governing agent that motivates me, or I like this one, the seat of my feelings. That's what my affections are. It's the, 
the thing down inside of us that fuels virtually everything we do. So how do my affections restrict me? Now, that's what the Bible says, so undoubtedly it's true. How do my affections or my desires or my feelings restrict me? And here's why. Right or wrong, holy or unholy, good or bad, my affections are the object of my pursuits. I pursue what I like. I pursue what I'm attracted to. I pursue where my affections are. And my focused pursuit of my affections causes me to neglect or outright abandon the affections of God, the church, and heaven. Me being led by me will not align with God. Look at this. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. King James Version. But every man, I want to get that settled. When I say every man, who does that mean we're talking to? Everybody, or maybe everybody at all the same time should say me. Very good. This is where we get in trouble. Everybody. Everybody gets in trouble. I don't know who I said. Maybe you're here tonight, and I, I, but I refer to it every now and again. That Flip Wilson stuff was funny, but it wasn't true. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with Flip Wilson? Yeah, Geraldine was a character of Flip Wilson and liked to say, the devil made me do it. Devil don't make you be bad. Here's what happens. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay. So what is lust? Desire. Helps word study. I like this because it fits with 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 12. It says you're restricted by your own affections. Look what helps word studies defines lust as. Passion built upon strong feelings. So if my affections are my feelings, then my lust are the desires and the passions built upon what attracts me. Okay? Now, every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Would anybody like to know what that word means? It means... Are you ready for this? This is deep. To bait a hook or a trap. Now, forgive me, but I'm just going to be plain because this is exactly what this means. My desires get pregnant when they mate with action to fulfill my desires. And the result is my desires, my wayward desires, coupled with the actions that fulfill my desires, and the baby that's born is called sin. So lust gets pregnant when it mates with action, and the result we is we give birth to sin. Notice this says every man. This is how it works for all of us. Y'all with me tonight? Good. And this baby called sin that we gave birth to grows and matures and sucks the life out of us until we're dead. Spiritually separated from our created purpose Separated from living in dominion is what we were created. You were not created to live subservient to your own wills and desires, but you were created to live in dominion. Then when we get dead spiritually, we continue to pursue our own lust and our own desires, 
because we're not connected to God anymore. So the only God we worship is us. And the fruit of that worship is we continue to do what we want to do. And now we're caught up in a vortex of continued failure. Ain't nothing ever worked right for me. Everything I've ever touched messes up. Everything that's ever happened to me is just spiraling worse and worse and worse down the toilet of victimhood. And the door of hope is shut. Because sin won't stop till it kills you. Not just separate you from God, but the mission of sin is to kill you. Because when we're dead, hope is lost. Therefore, is that pretty plain, Brenton? Is it clear? Everybody clear where we're at so far? Okay. Therefore, the ministry, the pastor, the preacher... We have a responsibility with eternal ramifications to preach, tell, yell, and otherwise impart the knowledge of holiness and holy living that destroys or negates the power of sin over us. And we have to do this because our life depends upon it. It's not optional. We have a responsibility with eternal ramifications to preach, tell, yell, hurt your feelings, whatever happens that shakes us out of living a life that caters to our feelings. Because when we're drawn away of our own desire and now we're at the tree, who said that? Brother Johnny said that in Elements. If Eve is not hanging out at the tree, the devil does not have an object of her affection to work with. Okay? So, I've got to teach it. I've got to preach it. But more than that, we, we, got to be looking for it. We got to be hungry for it because we realize, is there anybody in the house that your number one enemy in your life has been somebody beside you? I messed up more things for me than all the rest of the world put together. One of the greatest things that happens when we begin to mature in Jesus Christ is we find out how much we really messed up and how little that people really did to us. But when we are conflicted in ourselves, we hate everybody else. That's where fighting and fussing and cussing comes from. When I got a problem with me, I got to lash out at you. That's what the Bible says. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 13 says, So remember, he said, you're not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. It's our own lust that holds us back, not the word of God. And certainly not the limitations that the word of God gives us, the boundaries that the word of God gives us. That's not what's holding you back in life because heaven is not fitting in in the world. Heaven is not even succeeding in the world. Heaven is when you hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I don't, I, I don't want to be redundant, but he's not going to say it if you hadn't been it right. or if we haven't been it. So look at here. So he said, my heart's wide open to you. I haven't restricted you. You've restricted yourself by your own desires, your own feelings. Now in return for the same, I want you to be open. He says, I speak as to children. This whole Bible study don't work if we don't get this. I speak as to children. So what does it mean when he says, I speak as to children? Now, what's that? Ah, that's right. But here's, there's a foundation that that teaching is built on. 
When it says I speak to you as children or I speak to you as my children, relationship, the parental child relationship is built on parents who love their children and children who likewise love their parents. All right? Without that, without that, and I understand that right, just because, now hear me, I'm not being ugly and I'm keeping my eyes shut so I don't look at somebody. Just because you didn't have a good childhood and your parents were not good to you does not mean that this is still not true. Okay? I know that everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a story. Okay? Paul is stating his feeling of responsibility and love toward them is the same as a parent raising a child. But he's asking them, I want you to see this picture. He is asking them, who is he speaking to? Adults. He is asking them as mature adults to receive his teaching as from a parent to a child. Now, is there anybody besides me in here who has said, I wish I could go back and do some things over way back there? So what is happening in the spiritual realm is Paul is telling them, let's do it again. All right? Let's imagine if you could go through the simple perils of childhood with the maturity that you have now. Oh, it'd be incredible. So in effect, that's what's happening. He is asking them as mature adults to receive his words as they are intended, which is for the benefit of healthy growth and the deep love that comes from a proper parent-child relationship. Now, I'm just going to throw this qualifier out there. Ain't too many folks, I know ain't's not a right word, but it fits. And we're talking the same language. There are not too many people that know anymore what a proper parent-child relationship is. That's why, for instance, when the Bible talks about our relationship with him being like a marriage, that ain't saying much for a whole lot of the world. And by the same token, when he talks about the parent-child relationship, so what I would like for you to do is I don't care how terrible your childhood was or how good your childhood was, you know what the one you wished it was looks like. So look at it through that lens. Is that fair? Is that fair? So how do we teach a child we love them while at the same time preparing them to be healthy adults? Because that's what you're doing it for. You're not making a mind so you have some peace. You make them mind so they can be healthy adults. And then when they become adults, for goodness sake, let them go be healthy. So we begin teaching them to be healthy adults by showing them love and affection. We provide their needs, which at the beginning are very simple and very minimal. Hold them, feed them, clean their booty. You're in heaven. Right? That's all it is. As they grow, we continue to provide for them, continue to hold them and comfort them, but we also have to start teaching them right from wrong. That's generally a lot earlier than we want to believe it is. Huh? If they're big enough to tell you no or shake their head that they don't want to do what's right, you done too late to start teaching them. Now, all the grandparents, I, I'm a grandparent, okay? I, can, I, I know what y'all been saying for years. But we still, if you love your grandchildren, make them mine. Uh, 
Let me tell you something, Brenton. I ain't get too many amens around about that. <laughs> You're not doing them a favor by letting them slide and be bad at your house. Don't, don't, I'm the preacher and I'm telling the truth. I don't care. You cannot let children continue to be bad because the book says if you do, they will embarrass you when they get old. All right. I ain't scared right now. This is a Holy Ghost. All right, look at here. So we have to start teaching them right from wrong. I remember an argument I heard some grown folks having when I was a kid that their 12-year-old granddaughter wasn't at the age of accountability yet. She wasn't old enough yet to know right from wrong. You know what I say to that? Fooey. Fooey. Let me tell you something. If you're waiting until they're 12 to start teaching them right from wrong, the world's done taught them all the wrong. Okay. But you cannot teach right from wrong without enforcing it with discipline. This is by and large due to all of us are born with a fallen nature. When we are told don't play in the street, that does something to us. What's it do, Brenton? Why is that? Because we need to be taught right from wrong. And we have a natural inclination to be attracted to the wrong. Okay. Because being told don't is often an attractant rather than a deterrent. So when little Billy Bob mama tells him don't go in the street, as soon as he thinks she ain't looking, he starts sneaking toward the street. Mama, who's a good parent, sees him and she goes and grabs him and reinforces her teaching of don't play in the street with perhaps a little stronger words of emphasis. And in my case, I'm testifying right now, in my case, that often has to be followed up again with the Board of Education applied to my rump. <laughs> which was never pleasant. But it was all done to reinforce the directive. I'm not done yet either. It was all done to reinforce the truth. Playing in the street is dangerous. So why do we tell people don't play in the street? It's not because the street is evil or the street is inherently bad. It isn't because the street is the place to be and we want to make your life miserable. But it's because there's cars drive up and down the street, which may or may not run you over. But there's nothing that we can do to ensure they won't except teach you not to play in the street. And we teach you not to play in the street. Why? Because we love you. We love you. And I want you to be safe. And I want you to be able to grow up and let me have some grandkids. And I want you to be a good daddy and a good mama to my grandkids. And I want you to become healthy, vibrant, contributing citizens. I want you to become a giver and not a taker. Say, what's that got to do with playing in the street? Let them play. And watch how that works out for you. None of us do it. We all have some standards in our life of right and wrong, things we do or things we don't do. We just want them to be arbitrary for us when we get grown in the church. But Paul said, are you ready now? He said, oh, Andy, I'm starting to feel a little Holy Ghost on me. He said, I know you're grown. But for the sake of safety and the sake of maturity and the sake of becoming healthy, let's treat this like I'm the parent and you're the children. Yeah. 
Ain't nobody telling me what to do. <laughs> has there ever been a dumber statement that a kid has ever made or an adult has ever made? Everybody in this room's got a boss. Amen. Everybody's got somebody to be accountable to. Yep. Say, well, I'm retired. I ain't made accountable to nobody. Don't pay your light bill this month. Just don't pay your light bill. Tell them, I don't want to pay my light bill this month. You can't tell me what to do. Just go ahead. I bet them about Thursday night you'd be wishing you paid your cotton picking light bill. I know I'm being a little simplistic, but I'm laying a foundation. Are you buying it? Are you getting there? Look here. Hebrews 11 is an incredible chapter. Incredible. Within this chapter are a large number of small biographical testimonies of how the faith of certain men and women sustained them, blessed them, and delivered them, etc., as they made their way through life. Ultimately, they were headed toward eternal life. Brother David, by the way of Jesus Christ, even though they only saw him through the teaching and the prophecies of the prophets. But that's where they were on their way to. The last two verses of chapter 11 lay the groundwork for chapter 12. Chapter 12 is, now that we've seen Jesus, we can follow his example, reaching our world with the power and the hope of the gospel. And seeing the culmination of the plan of God for his prized creation come to pass. This is bigger than you and I. We have been called to be the vehicle whereby the culmination of God's plan for creation will come to pass. But we cannot do this without the knowledge that he loves us and the proper teaching of how to live in a manner that testifies of him. It's not enough to win your world by, by talking a good game. Talk is cheap. And anybody can do it. But we've got to find out what does it mean to live a life that testifies of Jesus Christ. The last two verses of Hebrew chapter 11 say, verse 39, and these all having obtained, man, I hope I get this across. God, I need you to help me right now. This is so beautiful and powerful. And these all, who's all these? Not everybody, everybody in Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. The roll call of faith. Remember, that's where we're at now. Think. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. It's the last two verses of the chapter that's the roll call of faith. The hall of fame of faith. And he says, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. All them people believed and they looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God, but they did not get there. Holy Ghost, these all died in faith. Verse 40, God, having provided some better thing for us, what is that? Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel and the testimony of a new and a better covenant. Whoo. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. One that's not predicated upon the bulls of blood, I mean the, the blood of bulls and of goats and bullocks, but one that is predicated upon the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was offered one time for everybody. God have provided some better thing for us. Look at here. That ain't the good part. That they, who's they? All them in the faith without us should not be made perfect. 
We magnify them and rightfully so. We brag on them and rightfully so. But they were incomplete. And the plan of God is for them to be made complete through us. Wow. The responsibility of completing what those folks started rests upon us. Let that sink in. Especially in light of the penny any things that we allow to derail us. Especially in light of these little itty bitty teensy weensy things that will cause us to say we're going to quit because somebody looked cock eyed at us. All right? Think about that just for a minute. We got bigger fish to fry than getting justification in somebody who don't like our shirt or the color of our eyeglasses. Huh? We got bigger fish to fry than somebody who sits next to us and maybe don't smell like we think they ought to smell. We got bigger things that are happening. You know what, Brother David? There's a group of people in heaven that are waiting on us uh, and counting on us uh, to get this stuff together and get it right uh, and make an impact in our world. God has called us uh, to finish what they started. Am I reading that right? Brother Shannon, we got a responsibility. A huge responsibility. And we think that we can form religion into something that's user friendly, people friendly, and fulfill this responsibility. Let me tell you what I just gave you a picture of. I just ain't in my notes, but it's good. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching for those things which are before me, I what? I press toward the mark for the what? The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Reckon that's it? Reckon that's the mark of the prize of the high calling? To finish what Ab- Woo! to finish what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob got started, to carry on what Moses was doing, to finish what the psalmist David was doing, to finish the work of the apostle Paul. Let me tell you something, honey. There's big things happening in the kingdom of God, and He called you to be a part of it, and He called me to be a part of it, and He called us here today to deliver unto us the blueprint, the plan of becoming. Church upon the whom the ends of the world will come. So, over the next, I don't know how many days and weeks and months, maybe even years, we're going to invade Hebrews chapter 12. I want to, I've been trying to teach for two weeks. The last two weeks I've been trying to teach on holiness and entertainment and we need it bad. We need it bad. Some of y'all watching things you ain't got no business watching and then bragging about it on Facebook, recommending it to one another. God have mercy on us. That's one of the reasons I had to get off Facebook. I get too much preaching material. Going and listening to people singing in concert we ain't got no business at. They promote things that ain't godly, that ain't holy. Matter of fact, they're antichrist, they're immoral, they're ungodly. And when you buy a ticket to their show, you're contributing to their mission. But I'm going to have to wait till the Lord says it's okay. Boy, you just got quiet in here. What's the deal, folks? Y'all was, woo! You mean I got to change that? You mean I'm going to have to deal with that? Well, surprise, surprise. You want to be a part of this? Or you want to be a part of that out there? You want to be a part of what we just talked about? 
You want to be a part of the kingdom of God, seeing fulfillment, or do you want to fit in with the world out there? We're going to have to draw a line in the sand, and we're going to have to make a decision, and we're going to have to make some declarations, and we're going to have to make some consecrations, some personal consecrations that says, this thing I will not do. But forgive me if I get too ahead of myself. <laughs> don't you be sick the next three or four Wednesdays because you don't want to hear it. <laughs> Look here. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also were compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. That is not the definite article for a particular sin. It's sin, period. Which does so easily beset us. How many have ever found out you don't have to work hard to be bad? Yes, sir. Well, that means you meet me and you are part of an exclusive club then. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I like this. You know what wherefore means? Wherefore. You know what it means? So well then. Since you know who you are. So then, or for that very reason, what reason is that? That they without us should not be made perfect. Are you happy to know we got a job to do? It's a beautiful thing, Brother Josh, that I can trust the Lord that when I need a building, he's going to provide one. but he ain't going to do it, Sister Marie, if I don't learn to obey his word. Oh, Brother David, I'm about to cause trouble right now. He's not going to do it too if we don't learn how to take better care of this one. Yeah. Ain't nobody standing up. I, I, I'm, I'm calling you to a higher place. I'm calling us to a higher place. And I ain't talking about the Bobos either because they was a cleaner last week. I'm telling you right now, don't let your kids trash the church. If your kids, I, I, don't, I really don't care if they make a mess. I care that you don't clean it up when you leave. Well, you say, what's that got to do with anything? We're on our way to the new Jerusalem, folks. He is preparing us to go to heaven, a place that he has prepared himself specifically and purposefully. And Brother David, I'm going to have to show him that I know how to behave in the house of God. Oh, Lord. I'm going to keep moving on, but just put you a little check mark right there because we're coming back to that too because that's got just as much a part of holiness as you having the right hair doing the right clothes on. Well, I might have to wait out a minute because I'm feeling a little bit of. <sighs> oh, don't worry, brother. Hey, let me tell you something. Josh, I love you. Brenton, I love you. Y'all keep on supporting me like you're doing. You're going to make some enemies. Let's get ready. Because there's going to be some people back there saying, oh, I wish you'd shut up. But let me tell you, y'all looking at me? Yep, I sure enough. When I drove my Ford Ranger all around town and my head touched the ceiling, my kids all, all of my kids' friends said I look like Donkey Kong driving that truck. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When y'all do all that stuff, it's like feeding the monkeys at the zoo. 
So just keep on feeding it, baby. Look at here. Look at here. So then, oh, I can't wait to say this. Oh, I can't wait. Look at here. Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let me tell you what that picture is. I want you to shut your eyes. And I want you to picture it. You're on a racetrack. And you're in the middle of a huge stadium. And the seats are full. And they're full of men and women who stayed true to the faith until they breathed their last breath and went to be with the Lord, so to speak. The picture is of a runner standing at the starting block getting ready to run a race. And the crowd that's in the grandstands are the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11, those that are mentioned and those that are not mentioned. And they're cheering you on. They're happy you're here. They're letting you know they're pulling for you and they believe in you. Look at that. Remember that word? That they without us should not be made perfect. You know what that means they're saying to us? No, 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 no. That's good. That's good. But you know what they're saying to us? Y'all can look now. They're saying, no, no, no. They're saying, we're better because you're here. That's what heaven's group is saying. That's what heaven's, that's what heaven's heroes are saying. It's a cloud of witnesses. Do you see that picture? You see that picture? You're running this race and you're running it to win and you have heaven's armies rooting you on. That's those from chapter 11 as well as those between then and now who have passed over. They're watching us, cheering us on with the knowledge that they've given us the baton. They've handed off the responsibility of seeing the plan of God come to fruition. It is in the mind of God that we are running the anchor leg, so to speak. The last push. The finish line is in sight and they believe we can do it. So with this awareness burning inside of us, the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight. I looked it up. Every weight. Burden. But I like this definition better because it fits encumbrance here's what it is y'all ready for this something I'm carrying with me that I don't need something unnecessary that I'm carrying with me that's slowing me down draining my energy stopping me from operating at full capacity so why am I holding on to it? Very obvious. I care about it. What'd you say? My affections are on it. It means something to me. I desire it. I want it. I like it. And I am arrogant enough to believe that I can fulfill the will of God and carry on to that too. But the book says... With the knowledge burning in you of what heaven's cheering section thinks about you, first thing you got to do is lay aside every weight, every unnecessary thing that's sucking you down, taking your energy, taking your life. Is anybody a witness in the house right now? called the uncommon life, by the way, living a life different than everybody else. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Which, which plays into this message tonight. Uh-huh. And I, I got a little ahead on one thing where it should have started. Uh-huh. But it, it said something along the lines of, what if we truly believe that God has perfectly designed us to do his work? 
Uh-huh. And, and he went on to talk about that he, he knows every hair on our head. Yep. He knows every mistake and how we fall short. Yep. Uh, and yet he is still for us. How would we act differently if we really believe? Yes. True. True. Because the truth is, even right now, when I'm talking about laying aside every weight, there are many of us thinking, and I hope he ain't talking about that. Oh, I hope he ain't talking about that. Just like this. <laughs> Devil convinces you to go get your nails all did. They didn't have flesh color, which that's another message. So you got some different color. Ain't it kind of funny? Boy, y'all. <laughs> Ain't it kind of funny that the same devil that'll tell you, go on and do that. You deserve to look sexy. You deserve to look pretty. You deserve to look like everybody else will get beside you at church. And when you start to raise your hands, he'll tell you, you can't be doing that. They'll all see it. Huh? Think about it. Y'all with me still? Huh? Ain't it time that we get out of the devil's sandbox? And we tell him we're tired of playing his little silly games. Ain't it time that we get tired of trying to, to trying to square dance with the devil and still go home to our husband? Ooh. Somebody say bless him, Lord, or something. Look here. Look here. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Yep. That's why you're exactly right, but the Bible does say that. Matter of fact, in the book of Song of Solomon, which I'm sure many of you can quote passage after passage, it emphatically says it will be the little foxes that spoil the vine. Oh, I don't know what he thinks he's doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to get a group of people ready to go to heaven. But I'm trying, until the trumpet sounds, I'm trying to get us ready to make a difference in our world. And you don't make a difference in your world trying to be like the world. All right. <laughs> I'm so nervous right now. Look here. So let us lay aside every weight. Ladies and gentlemen, the very fact that he differentiates between weight and sin means that you got things in your life that may not be sin, but they're still weighing you down and you need to get rid of them. Look here. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Let us also lay aside the sin. Here's what it means. Y'all ready for this? Y'all elements grew. Listen to me. At its simplest form, that word sin means missing the mark. So due to me being governed by my sinful nature rather than the divine nature, my reactions, my actions have resulted in me living a life a little off center. And another word for little off center is out of alignment with what God would have me to live. And what is the life that God would have me to live? One that they without Without us cannot be made perfect. That they without us won't be complete. All right. Then it says, which doth so easily beset us. So easily beset us. Here's why it so easily besets us. Are you ready for this? You know what that word means? Surrounds us is all around us. Everywhere you turn, there's an opportunity for sin. It's greater today. Hear me now. It's greater today than it's ever been. Any kind of sin you want to participate in is at your fingertips. 
We're surrounded. Come on, Holy Ghost. I need you to help me right now. You, you get it in your radio. You get it. Listen. It's not just TV that's a problem. It's not just movies that's a problem. It's cop picking commercials that they put on there that are assaulting you. Everywhere you look, uh, everywhere you turn around, we are being assaulted and attacked by sin. Uh, and we got to be aware that the Lord, what does. The Bible says, get it out of your life. Is that not what it says? Ooh. Lord, have mercy. That's why we take up the offering before the preaching, fellas. <laughs> Look here. Sin is easily and readily accessible. It's all around us, and it easily trips us up, entangles us, wraps itself around our feet when we're trying to run. You can't run toward the finish line. You can't press toward the mark when you're watching over here. Yahoo is my homepage. And for the last month leading up to February, how many of you center men know what comes out every February? Swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated. <laughs> really, for the last two months, Sister Maria, my Yahoo page has been inundated with old swimsuit issue pictures. I ain't looking for them. I ain't asking for them, but it's there. You know how far it is from me, Brenton? About that far. And you know what? Or, or this. Am I being too real tonight? Huh? Huh? The Bible says I got to get rid of that. I got to lay it aside. Okay? And let us run with patience. That word patience means endurance, steadfastness. You'll notice I put in italics because it's my definition. Focused. Aware. That's what we got to run. We got to aware that nothing short of completion will do. I cannot be happy with giving it the old tri college try. I cannot be happy with saying everybody else is doing it so I can do it too. But I've got to get something in my mind, in my spirit, in my heart that says nothing less than, I guess this is probably the best picture we have of it. I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. Yep. Henceforth, there's a crown. You know, it's not the crown of monarchy. You know what that crown is? Does anybody know what that crown is? It's the crown that they put on the head of the winner of the race. The one that Caesar would put, them little leaves that they would put. That's the crown it's talking about because nothing less than winning. Yep. Yeah. There's something there. It's just, you know, we know the story. Oh, brother. There was an attraction there that you couldn't get away from. I can't. Oh, I cannot tell you how many times lately, over the last three or four months, that the Lord has smote me with Remember Lot's wife. I can't tell you how many. It's, it's so powerful that you just said that. Because she couldn't make up her mind if she wanted to leave or not. And because she dallied around, God made her mind up for her. Now I want to tell y'all, my greatest, greatest hope and dream has come true tonight. That clock on the back wall broke. <laughs> yes, sir, Brother Johnny. Yes. Yep. Yep. As far as you, it could be said, he started that whole mess. Okay. He was leading his family, yep. and he set them to look in that direction. Ooh. In the first place. Yep. Ooh. Uh, 
And if I read the book right, Brother Johnny, some of them stayed. You know what they did, sister? If you think this, thank you, brother. You think this ain't powerful? You know what they did when Lot went to them and said, hey, guys, we're going to have to go? They laughed at him. They made fun of him. They, they said, you dress funny. And you wear your hair funny. And you don't look like the rest of the world. You're out of touch. We got things together right here. Just go on if you believe the world is coming to an end. Just go on. They laughed at him. And that leads me to my next point. And let us run with patience the race. It's important that you see that that's not just talking about a race. That's talking about a race you get in to win. That's talking about a race that halfway around the third lap you pull a hamstring. That halfway around the fourth lap your mouth, your tongue swells up about that thick and you start to get dehydrated. But you know, it, it's a race. It means it, Brother David. It means a race that's going to cost you something. We're not talking about taking a couple of laps in the kiddie pool. We're talking about a race that once you get into it, there's going to, have, there's going to come a time, there's going to come a point in that race when your desire has to overcome your flesh. And your desire to win overcomes your flesh. The struggle, that word means the struggle of an athletic contest, grueling, painful, but rewarding. That is set before us. Here you go, Brother Ronnie. You know what that word means that is set before us? It means the track for your race is already before you. Is already there. That's what it means. Set before us means it's already there. Divine destiny. The track, the race, the setting is there. Your destiny is set. But here's the question. Will you run the race? But you cannot run the race unless you get rid of the weights and the sin. You notice something, Brother Blake? He says not one word about the devil. The devil can't stop you from running your race, baby. He doesn't say, don't listen to the devil no more. And I'm not being disrespectful. He doesn't say, sing five times around. Devil don't allow no shouting around here. Devil can't stop you from shouting. The devil can't stop you from running the race. That's why he said you got to get rid of the weights, the unnecessary things that are slowing you down, and the sin that's all around you. The race that's set before us. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Opening up a new pathway for them. Uh huh. Is it possible to be in the, to mess up or be in the way of your own divine destiny by treating something that you are assuming is lust and desire when really it can just be fate or something positive, but you're being so careful about it that you're uh, yourself off the path and you end up missing something? Um, kind of. Yes. Half of it, yes. Oh, Dave was asking that. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, along those lines, like, because, you know, like, sometimes, sometimes I feel like, am I, okay. All right, let me say it like this. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Th th this one I'm going to tell you. And everybody else in here that hadn't been coming toward the Lord all that long. You know what stage you're in? The baby stage. And the expectations for the baby stage are very minimal. They involve, well, really I could go on a long dissertation right now because 
if it don't line up with that book and it don't line up in your case with people that you know and respect that you look up to the father figures stay away from it period when you are young you follow the examples of godly influence that's been put in your life does that make sense Okay, you do not allow sometimes those weights have a name and a face. Does that does that make some sense? If you cut loose of it and you needed it and God wanted you to have it, you'll know it. He'll bring it back to you. Probably not happening right now. If in doubt, cut it out. Really. So, because now we're about to, because really your question is for next week. So just hold on to it. Because look at here. So how do I know what my weights and sins are? This is laying the groundwork for next week. We find it in the second verse. Therefore, let me let me take me back one verse. Take me to verse one, real quick. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Next verse. Looking unto Jesus. You want to know what your weights and the sin are? That's where you find out how to live your life. Oh. That's where we're going next week. Are y'all ready for it? Yes. Yes. See, how, how do I know? That, that, that's what you're asking, Des. The way I know is I look into the life of Jesus Christ. Because everything he did, hear me now, everything he did, according to, I believe it's 2 Peter, says he did it as an example for us. That we might follow in his steps. That's where we're starting at next week. How do I know what the weights and sins are? I look to Jesus. I looked to Jesus. The author, it was his idea. He's the one that came up with it. He's the one that got this started. Listen to me right now. He's the one that decided he needed you in this world. And finisher, completer, perfecter of our faith. Look to Jesus. Stand with me if you would. Yeah. In my mind, that verse in Colossians chapter 3, set your affection on things, on things above and not on things above. Yes. Earth, for you are dead and not because of Christ. Yes. But also, like it just clicked with me that that verse doesn't say that anybody set your affections for you, but it simply states set your affections. Kind That's of like incredible. Everybody else was talking as a choice. Yes. Yes, it is. It is a decision we have to make. Devil can't stop you. Right. Lay aside the weights and the sins. It probably ain't a good song. I don't know the words to it. But I want to get this to play over the loudspeakers for Sister Heidi. Back when the Chicago Bulls were all that in a box of Cracker Jacks, they used to do this. Y'all ready for this? And then bust out with this real fast song. I'm going to get that put on the playlist for next week. Because that's what I feel like saying a bunch of times in a row. But you got Here's the thing. I love you. This is, this is, this is, Paul said, can I talk to you like a parent to children? I love you. But God, God has called us to a higher place. And now we have to decide. We used to sing it. We may need to revive it. Though none go with me. 
still I will follow. Take this whole world. I think we're there, Brother Shannon. I think we're there, Brother Larry Bobo. It's time to cut bait or fish. Because God's called us to a revival that we ain't ready for. But he sent pastor a word to get us ready. And you have your marching orders. Look to Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight. I love you with all my heart. You've been so patient with me and so kind and so long-suffering. You have blessed me beyond measure. You've called me with a calling, a holy calling, set on me with a powerful anointing, and, and I, there's no reason that I deserve this. But you've called me to the kingdom for such a time as this. And, God, you've given me the, the, the privilege of pastoring an incredible group of people and being a part of an end-time revival like we've never seen before. And, Lord, I'm honoring you with that, and I'm honoring you with your word. And I pray that this word will not soon leave us. I pray that everyone here will take this hand out home, and they will begin to study it and begin to check it. And I pray, Lord, they will lift their eyes to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And, and there we'll learn the weights and the sins that we need to cut loose of because you're taking us somewhere that those things can't go with us. Let us see that, believe it, and apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sunday morning's Christmas Sunday. We have a church at 11 o'clock. If the roads are too bad, then I'll let you know. But right now, one of Sister Kim and Brother Marcus's kids named Kenley told me, we got to have church. I got a new outfit. So... Love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>